What's going on, guys, and welcome to episode 282 of Hashtag Ask GSM here today for Wednesday, April 24th, 2019. I am Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well. And I'm happy to report that after two weeks, two and a half weeks, actually, I have finally caught up on everything from WrestleMania weekend. And even before WrestleMania weekend, I was super busy with stuff getting ready for WrestleMania weekend. So for like the first time, really in like three or four weeks, I'm not as busy as I was previously and there were times in the last two weeks where I had time to catch up on stuff but as you guys know as I mentioned on last week's show I was sick for like a week and a half um I got sick like right after Wrestlemania not because of Wrestlemania but because someone in my family got sick so I got sick from them like two weeks ago I was sick for the following week I finally like got back to like 85 90 percent by the weekend and I'm good to go now, so hopefully this episode will not feature nearly as much coughing as last week's did, but I'm finally back on track. As you guys have seen over the last number of days here on the channel, all the videos from WrestleMania Weekend have finally been uploaded. All the videos I took at TakeOver New York, G1 Supercard, all the videos I took at WrestleMania 35, and the Raw from the night after um, are all up as of today. The only video remaining left to put up here on the channel from WrestleMania weekend would be the big WrestleMania video blog where I took a lot of exclusive video of the Lexus and I getting ready for certain shows, coming back from certain shows, and giving her thoughts on each show. Um, so that'll be up at some point, probably in the next few weeks. I'm not sure when I can get that up. I'm actually graduating um, on May 11th. So I got that coming up. Avengers is coming out tomorrow, which I cannot fucking wait for. It's finally Avengers Endgame week. I've been waiting for this movie for a fucking year since Infinity War, so I can't wait for that. I'm going to a showing at 10.45 tomorrow. So it's going to be crazy. And the movie, as you know, if you've been following the news leading up to its release this week, it's a three-hour long movie. So I won't be out of the theater until at least 1.45, and that's not counting trailers and previews and all that other shit. So I probably will not be leaving there until like 2 a.m. Thankfully, I'm not doing anything Friday morning, but that's still pretty crazy. Um, I cannot wait for that, but like I said, graduating in a few weeks, a lot of exciting stuff coming up. I'm going to Money in the Bank with Alexis and her brother on May 19th here in Hartford, Connecticut, and then literally days later, double or nothing in Las Vegas the following weekend. So the month of May is going to be crazy. I'm just enjoying the calm before the storm. Um, to say the least, so I'm looking forward to that, but this is hashtag AskGSM, you guys sent in a boatload of questions this week, which I super appreciate, you're going to take the time to answer all of them, I'm not in as much of a rush today as I normally am, so that's pretty cool, so I'm hoping to spend as much time on each question as I can, if you want to send in a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine, at WrestleRant on the Twitter machine, with the hashtag AskGSM, Find me on Facebook as well at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Leave a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last, certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section of this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. So let's get started here. First question comes from Joe M. from YouTube. Their question was, I asked last week about whether or not M uh, Murphy, Ali, and Cedric Alexander could become major stars on the main roster. And while I more than understand your reasoning as to why you don't see them as main event stars, the thing I don't understand is that other people see similar superstars like Finn Balor, Andrade, and Ricochet as being potential main event stars. And while those three may have more of a fan following, personally, I don't see anything they possess that Murphy, Ali, and Cedric don't have. Do you view them as being on the same wavelength, or do you consider Balor, Andrade, and Ricochet to be a level above them? That's actually a very good question. So yeah, I did talk at length last week here on the show about why I do not think Ali, Murphy, and Cedric are not main event stars. Um, I think of the three, Murph, mm, Ali probably has the best chance of becoming a world champion. Murphy is right up there too. They're all great wrestlers. The issue, is, and Ali's actually a very good talker too, so I should not say that he's not a good talker. So is Murphy. Cedric of those three is the only one I do not see as a world champion. I don't. I may have said that at one point a few years ago, and the guy is great, but he was never great enough. Like, he doesn't have the personality that I think Murphy and Ali do, but even them, they just do not have that larger-than-life personality about them. Now, granted, they're not fucking six feet, 
I mean, they might be. I'm not sure. But what I'm trying to get at here is that they're not as big as Drew McIntyre. They don't have the size of Lars Sullivan or Braun Strowman. But neither does Daniel Bryan. So to say, oh, their size makes them like, you know, disqualifies them from becoming a world champion in WWE would be fucking insane because Finn Balor is the inaugural Universal Champion. So with Balor, Murphy, Ali, Cedric, I think what holds those guys back, and I hate to say this, Cedric, Ali, and Murphy, is that they were labeled as cruiserweight stars. And they were cruiserweight guys from the get-go. And because of that, they may never reach that next level. Now, granted, they're on the main roster now, and I think that's awesome. That being said, though, and Rey Mysterio was too. Rey Mysterio was one of the greatest cruiserweights of all time in WCW. He was a cruiserweight in WWE and went on to become a world champion on SmackDown for a little while in 2006. And just one of the biggest stars in general in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, that being said, though, I don't know, just something about Murphy. I mean, I could see them as world champion. I may have said they may never become world champion last week here on the show. Um, that's inaccurate. I think Ali could have very well been in Kofi Kingston's spot had he not gotten hurt right before, what was it, Elimination Chamber? So to say that Ali would not have become world champion is a bit stupid to say because he likely probably would have. He would have been in the same spot that Kofi Kingston was if he didn't get hurt. Um, Buddy Murphy, I could see in that spot. Cedric, I really do just see as like a maybe an upper mid-card level guy if not like a lower tier like main event guy. I, I highly doubt that. I think he's more of like a mid-card, upper mid-card guy. That's just how I view him. And the guy's a great wrestler. But on the mic, just personality-wise, he, he doesn't have the same thing that Andrade does, Balor does, Ricochet, or even Ali and Murphy. Um, but you are right to say, okay, if these guys can't become world champion, then why do these three possess? Like, what are those three possess that Murphy, Cedric, and Ali don't? You make a great point. Uh, with Balor, I can see that. A lot of people never really saw Balor as world championship material. And I think a big part of that was because they had built him up to be a big star in NXT. All three of them, I think, were built up to be big stars in NXT. NXT and 205 Live are on two very different wavelengths. 205 Live is like the cruiserweight division. People have viewed the cruiserweight division as being below WWE and the heavyweight guys and all that other stuff. For so long that people start to view them in that light, they're not as good as the main event players, which they've proven otherwise with Ali recently, and hopefully Cedric and, on Mur uh, and Cedric and Murphy can follow in their footsteps. But at the same time, though, um, Balor was built up to be a big deal in NXT. At this point, is the World Championship material? He'd have to get back to that point. Of the three, Andrade and Ricochet, I'd rather see have a, uh, have a World Title reign than Finn Balor. Ricochet is an amazing athlete. And could he become a world champion? Sure. Ricochet, though, I'm not going to sit here and tell you he should be world champion tomorrow. The guy's mic skills are sorely lacking. He's an amazing in-ring competitor. He's got personality for days. But, okay, so does Murphy. He's a great in-ring talent, too. Ricochet can't really speak for shit. He's not a bad talker. He has gotten better since his Lucha days. But that's not to say that he's world championship material. Andrade, at least as Zelina Vega... Him and Zelina are a money pairing. They have to be booked better, though. They just lost to Finn Balor on SmackDown this week, so you can't really view the guy as a future world champion if he's losing left and right. Um, but you are right, though. There's really not that many differences between Balor, Andrade, and Ricochet, and then Murphy, Ali, and Cedric, aside from the fact that Balor, Andrade, and Ricochet were not on 205 Live. They weren't cruiserweights. And that might be a cop-out answer, but I view them as being bigger stars, because they've had success in NXT. Um, Balor, a former NXT champion. Andrade, a former NXT champion. Balor, a former Universal champion. Intercontinental champion. Ricochet, a former NXT North American champion. Ali has yet to win a title in WWE. He had great matches on 205 Live. And he's a great wrestler. But I have yet to see him... And he's he just shined in the various opportunities he's been given since he arrived on SmackDown. Um, I do, I do not view him as a main event player. I just don't, but that's me personally. That's me personally. Other people might be different. Cedric, I really just don't think is world championship material, but not everyone can be a world champion. That's something I don't think people understand. Just because you're a great wrestler doesn't mean that you should be the world champion. Not everyone can be the fucking world champion. Cedric Alexander is not world championship material. Some people just should never win the world title. 
Murphy, it's debatable. Ollie, I could see. Cedric, I don't. Murphy can go back and forth. I like Murphy. I don't see him as a world champion. I could see him being an upper mid-card guy. I do not see him as being world champion. Balor might have been different if he wasn't booked so strongly from the get-go a few years ago. Andrade and Zelina are a money pairing, and Ricochet with more time could be that guy down the road. But if they have him lose to fucking Bobby Roode clean every week, then maybe not. It's all about perception. That's really the key here. Joe's next question. Someone asked last week about why SmackDown got shafted in the Superstar Shakeup, but I want to know why did 205 Live get shafted? We were led to believe that every brand was eligible, and they only got taken from with their two biggest stars in Cedric and Buddy leaving. I know they got Oni Lurkin, but even with him there now, they're down to just 12 full-time superstars on their roster, not including Noam Dar and Mark Andrews, who I wouldn't count as members of the 205 Live roster either. Noam Dar, I think, moved to 205 uh, NXT UK a few months ago. Mark Andrews has not been a consistent performer on 205 Live ever, so I don't know why he's on the roster page. I noticed that too. His question continues, why couldn't they be given Chad Gable, Raul Mendoza, and Shane Thorne, three guys who could undoubtedly thrive on 205 since they're probably going to do nothing on their respective brands? Um, yeah, no, I totally agree. 205 Live got fucking shafted. I talked about this in a What Culture article that actually went up this morning about how Raw got a bunch of talent, SmackDown got a bunch of talent, and 205 Live was a part of it. Um, they got talent taken from their show, though. They didn't get anyone else in return. Now, I know NXT's been a part of the shakeup. Um, Drew McIntyre got drafted last year. Andrade got drafted. Sanity got drafted. And NXT didn't get anyone in return from Raw or SmackDown, but that's to be expected, though. It's very rare that anyone ever really moves down from the main roster to NXT. That's just how it is. But it is possible to move people from Raw and SmackDown to 205 Live. Kalisto did it. Mike Kanellis did it. So I don't, I, I don't see why Chad Gable can't move to 205 Live, especially if he's just going to get fucking wrecked by Lars Sullivan every week and Jinder Mahal and all this other shit. I'm glad Gable's on his own again, um, and he's a very good wrestler. But if they're not going to do anything with him, and I talked about this last week on WrestleRant Radio, and I think the clip is on here on the channel, is up here on the channel, that if they're not going to do anything with him on his own, then just put him on 205 Live. They've had these opportunities before to push him as a singles competitor back in 2017, 2018, now 2019, and nothing. Nothing has ever stuck because they have yet to consistently put effort into, into pushing him a, on his own as a singles competitor. Um, so I'd rather see him on 205 Live. I completely agree with that. Raul Mendoza, I don't see why not. He and Umberto are a tag team in NXT at the moment an on and off tag team. Um, he's not really doing anything in NXT at the moment, so 205 Live would be a good place for him. He's not a he's not a big star though. None of these people will make or break the brand. They're going to be good, you know, good hands for 205 Live to have, but they need people on the level of Cedric and Buddy Murphy and Ali to make up for their absence. The Shane Thorne's another one. I mean, then again, I think people said the same thing about Buddy Murphy when he got you know, drafted to 205 Live last year, and he ended up being one of the best things on that show. So who am I to say? Um, but I do think they can pick up better stars than... I mean, I do agree they should go to at 205 Live. Chad Gable, or Mendoza, Shane Thorne, who's also really, really good. People would not know that, because Team 6 one was, in my opinion, largely underutilized in NXT. Um, and he's a very good hand in the ring. I've seen some great matches with him on NXT before, and on some of the live... like the WWE Network specials and stuff like that. He could really shine in NXT if given, or rather 205 Live if given the opportunity. A lot like Buddy Murphy, he might be another guy, and I'm not just saying this because they're both Australian, but he's another guy who on NXT would be great if the show wasn't already stockpiled with star power right now. There's people ahead of him who's going to be, they're going to be called up to NXT TV at some point and will be pushed ahead of him. People like Punishment Martinez, you know, ACH, Kushida's debuting soon. Um, you know, Shane Strickland. Shane Thorne is not going to get pushed over all those people. So putting him on 205 Live would actually be a really good idea. I'd love to see that. Raul Mendoza, like you said, Chad Gable. But I said ACH. I think ACH could be a real big star in that show. Um, Trevor Lee as well. Kushida, I do not think should go to 205 Live. I think he's better than 205 Live. He should not be the second coming of Hideo Itami, who, yeah, was a good fit for the Cruiserweight division. He did nothing, though. And it was very obvious that he was better than that show. But he was already, like, he wasn't really that big of a star in NXT for the better part of his run there. So they didn't really have any other choice aside from graduating him 
from NXT to 205 Live. Um, but Kushida should not be in 205 Live. Like I said, ACH, Trevor Lee. I know there was someone else I was thinking of that should be put on that show at some point. Maybe it was Kushida. Um, but yeah, they have a lot of star power in NXT. They're not doing anything with it at the moment. Finn Balor, I think, is better than 205 Live. I've seen people, you know, uh, call for that. Rey Mysterio, I could see. Um, I said months ago I didn't really want to see that. But if he's not going to do anything on Raw, then I don't see why not. Um... But yeah, 205 Live desperately needs more people. There's only so many matches I can see between fucking Ari Daivari and Tony Nese. And don't get me wrong, Tony Nese has actually grown on me. I've enjoyed his run as a babyface so far. The matches with Buddy Murphy I thought were great. But who do they really have on that show that's left? And most of the people that are there have been there since day one. Akira Tozawa, great talent, but he's already won the Cruiserweight title. Um, there's no plans to re-push him again. He got a few title shots earlier this year, lost every single one. So he's not the next big star in that show. Tony Nese has been there since day one. The guy is good, but they need more than Tony Nese. R.I. Daivari does nothing for me. Oni Larkin's a good fit for the show, but he's not the same star that those other people were. The guy can't talk the same way that Ali could or that Buddy Murphy could. And he's also not as good as Cedric, and Oni Larkin is great, but I think Cedric's better. He's the overall better package than Oni Lorcan, who feels like a great hand to have in the ring. He doesn't feel like someone you can build around on that show. Um, that's really about it. Noam Dar's not on there anymore. Mark Andrews isn't on there anymore. I like Mike Kanellis, but he's not nearly as good as the other people on that show. Kalisto's good, but, yeah, I mean, been there, done that with him as Cruiserweight Champion. Um, who else even is there? Leo Rush, I do not think, is on 205 Live anymore. He's not been on the show in months. Drew Gulak is great, but again, another guy who's been there since day fucking one. They need new blood. Otherwise, I don't, I do honestly not know, I do not know what the future holds for 205 Live. Because I don't know how much longer they can last on Tony Nese and Ari Daivari. And I know the few just started, but Ari Daivari is not the answer to their issues. It's not the answer to their problems. He's not their next big star. And those other people were big stars because, you know, they weren't big stars previously before the big reboot of 205 Live about a year ago, um, but they were given more opportunities and they shined. So maybe the same can happen for a Chad Gable or a Shane Thorne or a Chad, uh, you know, a uh, Shane Thorne, Chad Gable or an ACH. Who knows? But at this point, all I know is that they need new blood on that show. Because like you said, for 12 or like 10 or 12 um, roster members on 205 Live, that's not good. I think the Raw Women's Division has more people in it than the fucking Cruiserweight Division does at this point. So they really need a reboot, like a hard reboot. The show's good, but they need more stars on that show. With Ali moving up, Murphy moving up, and Alexander moving up, they really need some new blood. And his third question, have you seen any movies this year? And how excited are you for Endgame? Dude, you have no idea how excited I am for Endgame. Maybe you do have an idea, but... Because I've been talking about it here on the show for like a year now. Um, I'm so pumped. Like I said, I got my tickets for 10.45 tomorrow night. We're going with a bunch of people. Um, it was the only showtime available where I could get like seven to eight tickets. Because all the other showtimes, we would have had to sit in the front row. And I don't want to break my neck watching Endgame. And that's at, it's at one of the AMC theaters around here. So um, it's going to be cool. I'm really look, looking forward to it. I wanted the maximum experience for Endgame. So we went all out and going to AMC, getting the, you know, the... Uh, retractable chairs and all that other shit. It, it's going to be great. It's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, I'm trying to stay away from spoilers. So far, I've been successful. I'm not looking at my Twitter timeline as much, not looking on the websites as much as I normally do, like 411 Mania. I saw they put up a review of the movie last night. I've pretty much been off the website since then. I'm not great with staying off of social media. I'm really not. But I'm going to have to make a conscious effort to avoid all spoilers before I go see it tomorrow night. I know they had the big movie premiere, I think, on Monday night. And I think the press got a hold of the movie either on Monday night or Tuesday night to watch it, you know, like the early screenings and stuff. And so far, I've seen no spoilers. So, And I didn't see any spoilers for Infinity War either. Now, granted, I saw that on the Tuesday night. I saw that days before it came out, and that's not the case this year. Um, but even in the days after Infinity War, like after it came out, um, I didn't see many spoilers online, even after I'd already seen it, which was cool. People were pretty much respectful about other people seeing it and not wanting to spoil the experience for them. So that's pretty cool. Hopefully we can have something similar with Endgame, and I don't walk into the show on Thursday fucking spoiled. So again, fingers crossed. But to answer the first part of your question, 
Um, have I seen any movies this year? Yeah, I've seen a few. I mean, I'm sure I've seen more, but off the top of my head, I know back in February, Alexis and I went to go see a double feature of The Lego Movie 2 and The Fighting With My Family. Lego Movie 2 was very good. Um, I enjoyed the first one. We watched the first... I had never seen the first Lego movie before I saw the sequel. Um, Alexis actually had me watch it a few days before we went to go see the second one. I enjoyed both movies very much. Fighting With My Family, obviously, the Page documentary. I did a full review of the movie here on the channel, like, right after I saw it, so check that out. I think it's under my miscellaneous um, playlist here on the channel, but... Yeah, I enjoyed the Page movie. That was a good movie. The Upside I saw back in January. That might have come out in December. Eh, actually, might have come out in January. Who knows? Um, that was a good movie. I really enjoyed The Upside with uh, Kevin Hart and Brian Cranston. Great movie. Captain Marvel, I saw that twice. Um, pretty good movie. Not not Maybe not amazing, but I thought it was pretty good, if not great. Not the greatest Marvel movie I've ever seen, but it was good. Um, Us I saw a few weeks ago. Honestly, I didn't really like it. I liked, you know, I liked the movie. A, Get Out was better. And B, Us had way too many plot holes for me to walk away from that movie saying that I thought it was awesome. It was a very good movie, don't get me wrong, but I thought after it was over, not to spoil anything, I thought there were some swerves that didn't really need to be in the movie. I felt like they were swerves for the sake of being swerves. I was like, what the fuck? Like, I don't know. I thought it was good, but I was kind of disappointed. And then I just saw Shazam last Friday, um, which was good. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a pretty good movie, very funny. Um, I'm not a big DC guy, but I thought it looked entertaining, and it was entertaining. I think it's well, well worth checking out. So, uh, yeah, I've seen Us. to the, Off the top of my head, I know I've seen Us, Shazam, The Upside, Captain Marvel, Fighting With My Family, and The Lego Movie 2 this year. Some pretty good movies, and it's only going to get better with Endgame coming out on Thursday. Then um, I might go see Aladdin, just for the fuck of it. Like, why not? Uh, I might go see Aladdin. Definitely Toy Story. The Godzilla movie I'm looking forward to. I liked the first one five years ago, so I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, Godzilla, Endgame, Toy Story, probably Lion King. Uh, Star Wars Episode Nine. that's all the way in December. But yeah, 2019 is shaping up to be a pretty big year for movies, to say the least. At Reborn Again, John Ritland from the Twitter machine, his first question was... Has there been any more divisive segment on WWE TV than the Firefly Funhouse, at least in the last few years? It's either that people love it or they loathe it, and I'm in the latter category. Um, I'll talk more about my thoughts and the Bray Wyatt character soon enough, but yeah, that segment has gotten a lot of feedback, like a lot of fucking feedback, which I think is great. It really is. I have not seen a segment that people either loved or they hated in a while. I'm sure there's one or two that just are not coming to my memory right now. Um, but it's the first time in a long while that a segment like that, either people really, really like, or they really, really hate. Um, it's already gotten, I mean, I'm sure it's gotten more by this point, but it had, I think a million and 400,000 views the last time I checked last night. And that was like before SmackDown. So I'm sure it has closer to like 2 million by this point. It was on trending on YouTube. Um, yeah, a lot of feedback. People either were like, this is the dumbest shit I've ever seen fuck this company for ruining Bray Wyatt, or like, this is masterful, this is amazing, this is exactly what the Bray Wyatt character needed, so, again, I'll, I'll talk about my thoughts on it in, in, uh, in a moment, but yeah, I have not seen a segment that controversial in quite some time, not, not, not controversial, it's not a controversial segment, it was polarizing, is the right word, the commentators, Michael Cole used to call John Cena controversial constantly on commentary all the time years ago, there's nothing controversial about John Cena. Polarizing is a different story. That's a different word. Two totally different words. That segment was a very divisive, like you said, uh, and polarizing segment on WWE TV. A lot of, lot of likes for that video. A lot of dislikes for the video. But it's not universally hated, but it's not universally beloved either. My Twitter timeline was all over the place with that Bray Wyatt segment on Monday. And it still is, even to this moment. As of Wednesday morning, people are still talking about that Bray Wyatt segment more than anything else from Raw this week. So it's not like, oh, the Viking experience, we all fucking hate it, you know, which they should because the name sucked, and they thankfully tweaked it. It's not that much better, but it's a, it's a bit better. Um, it, It's not like that. That had a lot of hate online last week, but thankfully that was, you know, that was all universal. Thankfully it was tweaked because people, they, they realized how dumb it was, um... But that was all universal disdain for the Viking experience name. This is way more polarizing. There's a lot of people who like it. There's also a lot of people who hate it, though. 
So we'll see how they follow up on it next week. If nothing else, it's gotten it's it's gotten the wrestling world talking, and that's I'm sure that's what they were going for, and they certainly succeeded in that respect. Um, John's second question here. So WWE first canceled Backlash on the 16th of June because of the Saudi Arabia show. Now they've rescheduled it for a week later on the 23rd. What exactly is this company doing with their pay-per-views? Um, so yeah, I think the Backlash on June 16th, that was never made official. I don't know where that's coming from. I've seen people say that or tweet about it or report it, whatever. No official reports, though. I don't think Backlash was ever in the cards for 2019. As far back as earlier this year, I do not remember ever hearing about Backlash being a thing. I know they had put out, um, what was it? There was like a, a schedule that leaked, uh, listing all of the event dates and all the venues for WWE in 2019 through 2020. Like through WrestleMania next year was like a year-long list of all the shows they're doing and where they'd be um, emanating from. And so far they're all accurate. So I think it's a pretty I think it's a pretty legit list. And I don't think Backlash was ever listed. As far as I know, I don't know why Backlash, first of all, would be in June when you have the fucking money in the bank pay-per-view in May. So if any, I think that alone was enough of an indication that Backlash was not happening this year, because if anything, they would have put Backlash in May, which is where it's been for the last few years. So as soon as I heard that Money in the Bank was happening in May, I knew at that point Backlash was not happening in June. I figured we would get Money in the Bank in June, or rather, Backlash in, in or fuck, what am I saying here? I figured we would get Money in the Bank um, in May, with the Saudi Arabia show happening soon after. I don't know whatever was... I'm not sure what was scheduled for June. I think Extreme Rules has been announced for July. And obviously SummerSlam in August. I, I might be totally off here, but I just do not ever remember Backlash being a thing on the WWE tentative schedule for the pay-per-views um, as of a few days, weeks, months ago. I, I do not remember that. Uh, I know about the Saudi Arabia show. I think that was previously set to happen in early May. Not in June. So I don't know, again, what the fuck is going on with that. Obviously, that's not happening. It's late April, so that's not happening anytime soon. Um, if it's happening in June, I would imagine they'd be announcing it soon. I Again, I don't know what's going on with this company. So yeah, their, their pay-per-view schedule is all over the place. I like Money in the Bank being in June, and I was there last year in June. I'll be this year in May. I'll be at Money in the Bank two back-to-back years. But um, yeah, I'm not sure what the fuck is going on with their pay-per-views. Hey, less shows the better. Backlash was never really that. I like Backlash, but like... Last year's show was fucking terrible. Backlash 2018 was one of the worst pay-per-views I've seen in some time. Um, so maybe it's for the better that they're canceling it. But after Money in the Bank was announced for May, I knew there was no chance in hell that Backlash would be in fucking June. It's either after SummerSlam or if it's after it's after uh, WrestleMania. It's not like the middle of the summer. That makes no sense. So uh, yeah, I don't know what's going on right now with their pay-per-views, but hopefully they can settle it out and, and work it out very soon so we know for a fact what's happening in the coming months. We know Money in the Bank is happening next month. That's set in stone. July, I think, is Extreme Rules like it was last year. June is still on the table. We have no idea about June, but hopefully they can figure it out. Hey, no pay-per-view in June would be even better, to be quite honest with you. Less pay-per-views, the better. Whatever happened to the years... Whatever happened to the days where we'd get a pay-per-view like every other month? I miss that. I like that. Maybe it would make the shows worse? I don't know. The shows are pretty bad as they are, Raw and SmackDown, uh, with pay-per-views happening every month. I don't know if they'd be any better off with less pay-per-views. I'm not sure. Um, but again, hopefully we figure this whole thing out in the coming weeks. His next question, have you ever bothered watching any, uh, many if any, of the old Raw and Nitro episodes from the Monday Night Wars. If so, do you feel they've aged well or poorly? I've watched some, and let's just say they are not as good as I remember them being from when I was a teenager. Um, not really. I watched... I know I watched the first few episodes of Nitro back in, like, 2015, because they celebrated 20 years, I think, so... I watched the first few episodes of Nitro, but you're talking about, like, the Monday Night Wars, so those don't really count. Um, Nitro, no. Raw... No, but I did watch one or two episodes a few years ago with my buddy John, who's been here on the show, obviously, a number of times before. We watched, for whatever reason, an old Raw from like 98, 99. It was fucking terrible. The thing was, though, I wasn't surprised. I know the show, I mean, okay, maybe I shouldn't say terrible. It's not my cup of tea. I think a lot of the shit they did back then, yeah, the Stone Cold stuff was cool. Even that kind of got a little, you know, uh overexposed by a certain point, even that was kind of a 
done to death by a certain point in 2000, 2001. But with, you know, Sable and, and you know, shit they were doing back then, it, it sucked. A lot of it sucked. And people, you know, wear these rose-colored glasses... And I think it's the greatest era in the in the period of this company, which it very well might be in terms of merchandise and fans and excitement, which there was way more excitement back then than there is today. I realized that. The matches weren't nearly as good, but that wasn't really as much of a factor as it is today. Um, but that being said, though, people love that shit because they grew up on that shit. People remember growing up as teenagers, as young adults, as kids, watching the Monday Night Wars because they got to see tits for the first time or they got to fucking see Stone Cold Steve Austin flip off his boss. And that's great. I didn't grow up on that, so I really do not give two shits about the Attitude Era or the Monday Night Wars. People aren't going to not, they're not going to want to hear that, but I'm sorry. I just think that shit sucks. I really do. I grew up in 2008. You may be saying, what the fuck are you talking about, you dumb Mark? You grew up at a point, you grew up at a point where the PG era debuted. We had some of the worst content around that period in time, which you were absolutely right in saying. You were completely accurate in calling it one of the worst eras in recent memory. That 09-2010 period was pretty fucking bad. But I'm just saying, I think the Attitude Era stuff is maybe not as bad, but a lot of the stuff they were doing at that point was not good. It really wasn't. The show was a bit better off because it was two hours compared to three, uh, you know, nowadays. Raw would be way better off as a two-hour show. Not tremendously better off. I mean, but that goes without saying that Raw would be better if it was a shorter show. Then again, Raw was shorter back in 2009, 2010, and a lot of those shows were fucking trash. Um, but yeah, I, when I watched that old episode, I forgot what episode it was. I'm sure it was from 98, 99, whatever. This was years ago. I watched the back with John. And we watched it, and I'm like, this sucked. This was terrible, but I wasn't surprised. I wasn't like, oh, I can't wait for this greatest Raw Attitude Era, uh, the, the greatest episode of Raw in the Attitude Era ever. I can't wait for it. It's going to be amazing. Then I was disappointed. I knew going in what I was going to get because I'm well aware. I'm like, again, I didn't grow up in the Attitude Era, so now I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I know everything about the Attitude Era, not even, not even close, but I know enough about the Attitude Era to know that it's not for me. In my opinion, that shit sucked. For other people, it may be the greatest stuff they've ever seen. It's all subjective. The ratings were through the roof. That's great. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the actual content. The actual content was no good. So maybe you have a different opinion if you go back and watch it. Again, totally different time period, totally different era. I understand that. For me personally, that shit's not for me. I, I could not give really two shits about those old Raws from the Attitude Era. At some point, I'll go back and watch them all just to say that I did. Um, but when I go back and watch snippets, I'm like, this sucks. Like I watched a lot of paper. I've watched every pay-per-view available on the WWE network for WWE. I've, I've watched and reviewed every WWE pay-per-view on that network for WrestleRant. So I've seen every 98 pay-per-view, every 99 pay-per-view. And anyone who has watched those videos and heard me rant and ramble about the old Attitude Era shows know that I'm not a fan of that shit. I reached my breaking point when I had to fucking watch William Regal versus naked fucking Midian for the European title on a pay-per-view. What the fuck was that? So again, it's not for me, but that's not to say that it's bad. I think it's bad, but you may disagree. Um, I know you, John, obviously grew up in the Attitude Era, so you were probably hoping for a little bit more when you went back and watched some of the shows. That's totally understandable. I didn't. So I realized that it wasn't really that good. I can't even say in retrospect because I didn't grow up at that point. But I was already well aware going into the Attitude Era viewing that it wasn't really that good. So I wasn't shocked. Other people maybe because they grew up on it and they're like, wow, this was amazing as a kid. And they go back and watch it and they know it sucked. There's a lot of stuff like that though. Again, I grew up in 2008 as a wrestling fan. I go back and watch, what, I, I go back and watch some of those shows. They're not nearly as good as I remember them being from when I was a kid. <laughs> because as a kid, you're like, wow, wrestling's amazing. And then I'm, you know, not a kid. I was fucking like 13, 14. But you go back and watch it now, and I'm like, oh, shit, this was, you know, this wasn't good. Like, a lot of this shit was terrible. You know, that's just what it is. As a kid, you don't really care. And people watching today will go back and watch, you know, Raw from 2019. They're like, wow, I'm fucking, um, you know, what's bad? Oh, the Viking experience. I thought that was a great name as a kid. Now I go back and watch it and realize how dumb it is. So that applies to everybody. At Rusty Rages from Twitter, his question was, what do you think of Bray Wyatt's new gimmick slash character? So here it is. I like it. I do. Uh, obviously, we have to give it more time. 
if I was given a choice, thumbs up or thumbs down, with my immediate thoughts on the Bray Wyatt character, I'd give it a thumbs up. Because you know what? And I said this on Twitter. It's something different. And you know what? They very well may go on to, you know, saddle Bray Wyatt with a kid-like gimmick. They did the same thing with the Funkasaurus years ago. I remember the exact same reaction to when Brodus Clay debuted. Literally almost, this is, it's almost scary how similar it is. But you go back to 2011, 2012. They built up Brodus Clay for weeks with those vignettes, making him out to be a fucking killer. And I liked Brodus Clay. He wasn't nearly as good as Bray Wyatt, but I, th- I liked him. I thought he was good. He debuts as the Funkasaurus. I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? And people were like, maybe he's psychotic. Maybe he'll turn heel soon. Maybe it's all a ruse. It wasn't. He was the Funkasaurus for the next two years, never recovered, and got released six months later. Not saying the same thing's going to happen to Bray Wyatt, but this very well could be a very similar case where he debuts a gimmick like this and people think, oh my God, they come up with all these theories for why he may have lost his mind or he was institutionalized or this or that. And it turns out it really was just a fucking kid show. And they were just giving him a kid's gimmick because they have nothing better else for him. They have nothing else for him. I really don't think that's the case. I don't. But we don't know. I have come to expect nothing from this company. Expect nothing appreciate everything when it comes to what they give us and, you know, just trying to make the most out of it. That's really what I've come to believe with WWE. That not everything's going to be amazing. We have zero faith in this company when it comes to creative decisions made. Um, So just take what we're given and make the most of it. The Bray Wyatt thing, I think, could be leading somewhere. I know he replied to a tweet from Essie Scoops last night, and I read the article with Alexis, and it let it like listed off all the theories for what may have happened with Bray Wyatt that he was institutionalized, that he was tweeting about being institutionalized late last year. If so, bravo, bravo. That is some great long term storytelling. If that is indeed the case, but again, that's giving the company way too much credit. This is the same company that gave the War Raiders. The Viking Experience name, for no fucking reason aside from Vince McMahon wanting to change the name on a whim. So again, I have zero faith in WWE. I really do when it comes to shit like this. But on a personal level, I'm willing to give it a chance. Because I've rewatched the video a few times now. It looks kind of cool um, in terms of what they might do with it. It's fucking creepy as shit. So if this works out and there's a bigger plan in place here, this could be one of the best things this company has ever done. Making people think that they're giving him a kid's character, but turning it into something way more. And you know what? And again, I forgot to mention this before, but I mentioned this on Twitter the other day, after the vignette aired on Monday night. Bray Wyatt is dead in the water. I do not want to see anybody saying that this new character will ruin Bray Wyatt. Because I don't know where the fuck you've been for the last five years, but Bray Wyatt was ruined years ago. Bray Wyatt has been so dead so lifeless as a character. I have given zero shits about Bray Wyatt for years now. Now, the Bray, the, the Matt Hardy thing last year had promise. They cut it short. They didn't really do enough with it. The whole babyface Bray Wyatt thing with them as the tag team. I'm not really counting that. I'm talking about when he lost to John Cena at WrestleMania a few years ago. I'm talking about when he lost to The Undertaker the following year. Or then he was fucking verbally buried by The Rock the year after that, and then lost the WWE title in one of the worst WrestleMania matches I've ever seen at WrestleMania 33. He had that awful feud with Finn Balor for a time. Bray Wyatt cannot catch a fucking break. The guy has been pushed and and de-pushed so many times, it's at the point now where I don't give a fuck. We had a recurring joke here on the show, uh, a running gag, if you will, here on the show many, many years ago that you guys would ask me questions, what's next for the Wyatt family? And I would laugh and say, who cares what's next for the Wyatt family? Because they are always built up just to lose. Every fucking time. The Wyatt family, they get a few wins, and then they lose to the Brothers of Destruction. They give Bray Wyatt a few wins, and they have him lose to Roman Reigns. They give Bray Wyatt a few wins, and they have him lose to Finn Balor. Again, who cares? Who cares? So at this point, Anything is better than what he was doing before. Eater of Worlds, oh, I'm here. Well, like, whatever. The character was great. They had a great character five or six years ago. That character is fucking dead. 
He may go back to it at some point. He may do a take on that character with this new character that he has. But the whole Eater of Worlds thing and all that other shit is dead. They ruined it. I immediately associate that shit with failure. The guy was a fucking loser. And again, I've said this before. Why do you call this guy a loser? He's a great talent. Yeah, he is a great talent. But when you're booked like to lose, when you're booked to lose all the time, ergo, you're a fucking loser. So again, I'm hoping that this is a big reboot for him. This is the refresh that he is desperately needed. But again, he can't get much lower. So why not? Why not? The guy was already ruined. He's been off TV since August. The last time we saw him, you could hear crickets every time he came out. No one gave a shit about Bray Wyatt for the most part. So why the fuck not? Even if this turns out to be a huge disaster, I will not eat my words. Because you know what? At least they tried. At least it's something new. Because honestly, there was a point where I thought he would just leave. Because he has not been on TV since August. So it's, it's better than nothing. We'll see. I don't blame people for not liking the character. I'm just talking about you know where I'm coming from here. Where the guy has been so just there's nothing there nothing i would fall asleep during every promo that he would cut on tv because he would talk and talk and talk and do nothing unfortunately samoa joe is becoming that same person doing all the talking and then he loses <coughs> excuse me all the time uh he's becoming the new bray wyatt but bray wyatt man like god it just it frustrates me because he could have been something with that character that character I don't want to say it could have become the next Undertaker, but it could have been on that level. He didn't have to win all the time. And I hate that fucking argument. Oh, he doesn't have to win. Undertaker, dude, Undertaker went undefeated at WrestleMania for 20 years. Plus, he was undefeated in singles competition for a year before he finally lost. He became WWE champion within his, fir within his first year of being in the company. He had matches with Triple H, with The Rock, with Stone Cold Steve Austin. He would beat these people. Bray Wyatt, what was the last big name that Bray Wyatt ever be? Oh, Seth Rollins and Great Balls of Fire? Who gives a shit? Who cares? So again, he needs big wins, and they need to start building him back up to be a big deal, regardless of what character he's given. Until that happens, I don't care. But I'm willing to give this character a, a chance, because again, at least it's something, and at least he's on TV. Because quite honestly, he should have left years ago, if this is how they're going to treat him. But he stuck around... They're giving him this character, whether he came up with it or not, who knows. But I'm I'm mildly optimistic here. Maybe cautiously optimistic, that might be the right word to use here, because this might end up crashing and burning. But I'm willing to give it a chance. His second question, is WWE dropping the ball with the women's tag team titles? Yes, they are. Um, they started out well with that very good women's elimination chamber match a few months ago when Banks and Bailey won the belts. Um, they started out great as champions. They won more often than not. They were on NXT for a night, which was pretty cool. It's like, wow, they might actually do something with these titles. And then they lost to the Iconics um, on SmackDown before WrestleMania, which was dumb. And then they lost to WrestleMania. And the Iconics have been booked to look like losers ever since. And don't give me this argument like, oh, you know, they're great heels. Duh, they're all, they, they get great heat. Do they really, though? Do they really? Yeah, for whatever reason, the crowd went nuts when they won the belts at WrestleMania. I, I cannot figure out why. Maybe because there was Australian people in the audience? I don't know. The Iconics, I like them in NXT. They are so fucking annoying on SmackDown. And not in a good way. Not to the point where I want to see them get their ass kicked. To the point where I don't care. And I want to change the channel. It's like lay cool level heat. Good God, they are so awful. Their material is so fucking bad. Their promos on SmackDown this week were so fucking bad. And they lost again. They lost last week to Naomi and who was it, Bailey, on Raw. They lost that Eat Woman tag team match on SmackDown. They lost to Naomi this week on Raw. They lost to Kyrie Sane on SmackDown. They're fucking losers too. So again, if you book people to look like losers, I am not going to care. So yeah, the women's tag team titles are already a joke. Maybe they're just doing this to you know speed up the process to get the belts on Kyrie and Asuka. Maybe they'd be better off at that point. Whatever they've been doing with the belts the last couple weeks has immediately erased any goodwill that Banks and Bailey were able to build up for those belts and make them mean something. Already, they're just another fucking title. Because if the champions lose as often as they have been, why are they champions to begin with? 
They're losing as freaking uh, they're losing as frequently as they were prior to WrestleMania. What's different now that they have fucking pieces of gold around their waist? Nothing. They're the same people. They still can't win a save a match. They can't win a match to save their lives. So, uh, yeah, they're dropping the ball in the titles big time. Hopefully they can rebound when they get the belts in someone else. I don't know why they put the belts on them to begin with. And I don't mind the Iconics, but again, they're just, their promos are so bad. And I like them a lot more in NXT. Um, they've just been, they've been booked to look like losers on the main roster. And again, so have Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins, and they're the Raw Tag Team Champions. So what makes that different? There really isn't much of a difference, to be honest with you. Billy Kay and uh, Peyton Royce, though, God, they're just they're just so obnoxious to even listen to. And their matches last all of fucking two minutes. So why should I care? Just when you win a title out of nowhere, it doesn't really... I don't know. I felt like Hawkins and Ryder had a better story when they became Raw Tag Team Champions. Billy Kay and Peyton Royce just kind of became champions out of nowhere, randomly, for no real reason at all. I guess it's better than Nia Jax and Tamina. That's not saying much. Uh, Rusty's third question here. Will Roman Reigns being on SmackDown be good for ratings on Fox? Oh, absolutely. I don't know if the ratings are going to improve drastically on Fox um, with Roman Reigns with the big dog on the show, but it's not going to hurt. People aren't going to not watch the show because Roman Reigns is on the show. If anything, I think it's going to help ratings. Um, I do think Raw ended up with a better roster coming out of the shakeup, but if it's a better show, that has nothing to do with the roster. It's all about the writing teams. They can make the most out of a shitty roster, so we'll see. But I do think Roman Reigns being on SmackDown is a good move, and it will absolutely help the ratings. Again, they may not go through the roof. They're not going to be Attitude Era levels. They may not be better than Raw, but it, it they could be better. I don't see them getting worse. And even if they decrease, it's not Roman Reigns' fault. Again, people aren't going to tune out of SmackDown because Roman Reigns is on the show. If anything, because it would be because the creative is shit or for whatever reason. Uh, it's not Roman's fault, but I do see him, if anything, helping the SmackDown ratings when they move to Fox later this year. And his fourth question, do you see Sasha Banks, or do you think uh, Sasha Banks will actually leave WWE? I don't think so. I think it might be a case where, like, the revival, like, with the revival, where they reportedly threatened to leave, and then they were given the Raw Tag Team titles, and I would assume they're fine now. They're a bit better off than they were before. Um, Banks, not to say they're going to bring her back and make her champion from the get-go, but... I do think she'll get over it. And unlike the Revival, I mean, I think the Revival might be under contract for for the next year. Uh, Sasha Banks might be under contract for the next two or three years. And that's the price you pay when you sign a multi-year contract. You have to know shit like this might happen or you're going to want to leave. So then don't fucking sign a three-year deal. Like, I don't know. I, I feel like part of this falls on Sasha. It's not just the fact that, oh, she's been buried. Okay, then why would she sign a three-year deal a year ago? This is not a new phenomenon. Sasha Banks has been booked the way that she has been for years. For at least for two or three years. So this is not a new phenomenon that she went from being the headline star that Charlotte or even Becky is right now to being a loser on the roster. Now she wants to quit. This has been the case for a while. So if anything, this is her fault for signing a contract that that's long. That, that, for, you know, for signing a contract that's for two or three years in length. That's just stupid if you're not happy with where you are. So, I don't know, I just got to put on your big boy pants and go back to work. And just They're not going to release her. They're not going to release her with AEW being a thing. That, that would be incredibly stupid. I, I could blame the company for not wanting to let go of people like, you know, Luke Harper. Like, he's not going to be a game changer. Sasha Banks wouldn't be a huge game changer, but she's a big star. They should not just willingly let her go. You can't just fucking walk out of a contract. I mean... Yeah, CM Punk did, but his contract expired in the summer, so at least he knew there was an end date there. Banks may be under contract for the next fucking two or three years. Neville did the same thing. That that was kind of dumb, but, you know, at, you know, he had a year left on his deal, so he waited it out. Banks, as far as I know, may be under contract for the next two or three years. So, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I do think at some point she will come back, though. She'll get over it. All oh, their fucking tag titles. Who cares? She'll get over it. She'll come back to work, and it won't be that big of an issue. But uh, no, I don't think she. Not she won't leave right now. I don't think. I think she will come back to TV before long. But that's just purely my speculation. At RJ underscore Marcel from the Twitter machine. His first question was, "What is more crucial to a superstar's career: the proper title push, or when they're called up to the main roster?" So I guess what he's basically asking here. Uh, What's more important to a superstar's career, the debut or the follow-up? It's absolutely the follow-up. 
Absolutely. There were a lot of people that had great debuts. Enzo and Cass had one of the better debuts I've seen in at least five years. They had an awesome debut back in 2016. They're no longer in the company. Because they were booked like fucking losers for the better part of the run of the company. Yeah, they were popular. But if you can't win when it matters most, people kind of start to lose faith in you. And then they got broken up and one of them got accused of rape and then the other one got fired. It's a, it's a whole ordeal. But the, the, the thing here is, is that, oh yeah, they're called up to the main roster. Okay, what buddy do that? But it's all about the follow-up. Kevin Owens is a rare case of a guy having a great debut and actually becoming a success story after that. Becoming Universal Champion, United States Champion, Intercontinental Champion. Now he's chasing the WWE title. He's constantly been a, um, you know, he's constantly been positioned as a top tier talent on either Raw or SmackDown. Kevin Owens is is a rare case though. There's a lot of people that debut with fanfare and fizzle out. Enzo and Cass were one of those people. Um, you could really name any any fucking you know call up from the last number of years, and that's that's who it would be. You know, Bray Wyatt had a great debut was booked like shit for years after the fact. So, again, it, it really doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter about, like, how hot of a debut you have. Yeah, Jericho had a great debut. He was booked to look like a fucking... He was he was losing a, a viscera um, on, on heat months after the fact. So, a debut is one thing. It's all about the build-up to the title picture and the follow-up from the debut. Jericho, his title plays, eh, you know, early on the Undisputed Era, or the <laughs> Undisputed Era, the Undisputed title shit, uh, was good, but, yeah, you know, he, re- he didn't really come into his own as a main event player until he came back in 2008. That was really when he started to find his footing as a main event level heel. So, uh, yeah, I think the proper title push is way more important than being called up to the main roster. Because you don't have to have the hottest debut to be a superstar. Stone Cold Steve Austin showed up as the fucking ringmaster. And he was a loser for a little while before he, you know, re-Christians himself, re-Christianed himself as Steve Austin, <coughs> excuse me, Stone Cold Steve Austin after that, the Texas Rattlesnake, Austin 316, so on and so forth. The Rock is a pretty generic babyface when he first showed up to WWE. No one really gave two shits about The Rock until he turned heel and joined the Nation of Domination and won the WWE title and so on and so forth. So the proper title push is infinitely way more important than getting called up to the main roster, at least in my opinion. His next question, I love this question because we just got done talking about this. What is next for Bray Wyatt? Ah, the ever green question of what is next for the Wyatt family. Just tweaked a little bit for what's next for Bray Wyatt. I know he's genuinely curious, but I I thought that was funny because uh, RJ and I would joke for years about how people would ask constantly, here on the show, they would ask constantly, week after week, what do I think is next for the Wyatt family? And I would always laugh because they were always losers. They were always booked to look like fucking losers. At this point, um, they should continue to play these vignettes for a while and give people more of an idea of whether it's all a ruse or if it really is a kid's character, what they're doing here. I would run these for the next two or three weeks, maybe until Money in the Bank. I would have them come back either Money in the Bank or the night after. Um, I think that would be best for his character. And, uh, yeah, you just go from there. So I like I like what they're doing with the Bray Wyatt thing. I already talked about this. I, I do think it can work. Hopefully they don't drag this on forever. Um, but the whole institutionalized thing would be really fucking cool. I think, it, I think it really could be. As far as what you do with him after that, that's a different question. Uh, who do you feud him with? I would keep him as a heel, obviously. Um, who do you put him in a feud with? There's Rey Mysterio. That's a fresh feud. I wouldn't mind seeing that. They have Cedric Alexander. I wouldn't beat Cedric at this point. I wouldn't beat him like a drum. I think he, you know, should shine on his own before getting beaten by Bray Wyatt. Uh, but I think Rey Mysterio is a good choice. I do. I think a Bray Wyatt Rey Mysterio feud could work. Um, there's the Miz. I would rather see the Miz flourish as a face, but that wouldn't be a bad idea either. AJ Styles eventually. Uh, I know they've done Bray and Rollins before, but down the road that could work. So they have choices. They do have choices for who they could, uh, position Bray Wyatt in a feud with. Um, I know they have Joe on that show. He's a heel right now. There's a lot of talent on Raw. So I do think Bray Wyatt, if positioned with the right person, and they tread lightly with this character, 
it could work. So I'm looking forward to seeing what's next. For the first time in a long time, for Bray Wyatt, I am looking forward to what's next for him. At the underscore Derbinator from the Twitter machine, his first question was, how do you feel about Cedric Alexander and Buddy Murphy being moved to the roster proper? I like how you worded that. Um, I like it. I talked about this last week, but I do like Alexander and Murphy a lot. I like the fact that they were separated. Uh, one was on Raw and the other's on SmackDown. I do think they're better off in those respective shows. Alexander, I've been high on since I saw him. I mean, even before the CWC, I was a fan of his in Ring of Honor. Uh, but he really impressed me in the Cruiserweight Classic, so... And he always had a higher ceiling in the cruiserweight, than the cruiserweight division. He made, you know, great deal with what he had as the cruiserweight champion. Had some awesome matches with Murphy, uh, Ali, and a number of others last year. But it was time for him to move on. Buddy Murphy is also a tremendous talent. Uh, he's really come into his own, gotten in great shape in time for 205 Live. Had a very good run as cruiserweight champion. Had some really good matches with Tony Nese, um, Mustafa Ali, Cedric Alexander, Akira Tozawa. So yeah, Buddy Murphy had a very good a very good run as champion too. He's another guy that is a, a bit better off than the Cruiserweight division. I feel like he's a guy that is uh, better off without the Cruiserweight division and has a higher ceiling than 205 Live. So now the key is pushing them properly. Um, having them on the main roster is great and all in theory, but if the company doesn't do anything with them, then it doesn't matter. So, I mean, Ali isn't exactly being pushed as a main event level star right now. But he's had some success. You know, he's been in feuds with Samoa Joe and Daniel Bryan. He got hurt. But Ali's uh, fairly established so far. So Alexander and Murphy, I do think, have potential to be champions on their respective shows. Maybe not world champion, like I said earlier. But Alexander can absolutely, at some point, be a viable United States champion. And Buddy Murphy, intercontinental champion. I would love to see Murphy take the belt from Finn Balor and Alexander take the belt from Samoa Joe. I would love to see that. The Derb's second question, who do you see rising in 205 Live, or is it doomed to shut its doors by year's end like some believe? <sighs> I really hope not, but they turned 205 Live around about a year and a half ago and they gave the reins to Triple H, and the show was way better off, and it's still a good show. It's much better than it was around this time like a year or two ago. Not a year ago, but like a year and a half ago, or late 2017. The show was shit when they had like Enzo More as champion, but still, with 205 Live now losing... Cedric Alexander, Buddy Murphy, and Mustafa Ali, they need some star power to make up for the absences that I talked about earlier. You know, bringing in people like Shane Thorne, ACH, Trevor Lee, Chad Gable, maybe to 205 Live, if they won't do anything with them on SmackDown, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, but at this point, though, they don't really have anyone to build off of. Tony Nese is there, and I like Tony Nese, but Arya Daivari? Who gives a shit? Oni Lurkin is great. He doesn't feel like a guy that you can build around on that show, though. Um, so will it shut its doors by the end of the year? I have not heard that. I don't know where that's coming from. I don't know if that's a fan theory, if that's speculation from fans. I don't know. I have not seen that discussed anywhere on the internet, whether it be legitimate or not. I don't know. I don't think they'll, you know, shut down the show. I mean, fuck, they still have main event. Main event's been around since, what, 2012? But it's been airing exclusively on Hulu for, like, four of those years. So, <laughs> that being, I think it's been on Hulu now longer than it ever was on, like, network TV or on the WWE Network. So, if that's still going, I would not be surprised to see 205 Live, you know, last just as long, if not longer. So, they won't shut down 205 Live. It just may not be as good as it was from that, like, glory period from, like, February or March of last year through, like, October, November. Because that, in my opinion, was when the show was at its best. So we'll see, uh, but if I had to pick someone to rise up on 205 Live, Lorcan's great, Tony Nese is really good. They need more people than that, though. D Divari does nothing for me. They need more people than that. Uh, Divari does nothing for me. Lucha House Party, been there, done that with them, with Kalisto as Cruiserweight Champion. Akira Tozawa, again, been there, done that with him as Cruiserweight Champion. So I could see them bringing up the aforementioned likes of Chad Gable, Shane Thorne, ACH, I could see being a big star in that show, and uh, Trevor Lee as well. I think they could all do remarkably well on 205 Live. Would they be enough to have you know allow the show to return to the heights it was once at about a year ago? That's debatable, but it, it would at least make up for all the absences and all the absences and all the departures that have happened in the last couple of weeks and months. At Brett Bullet 10 from Twitter, his first question was. Will Bray Wyatt's new character be successful, or will it go back to being the eater of pins in a month or two? 
I really hope not. I talked about this before ad nauseum a, a couple of questions ago. But to bring up Bray Wyatt, or to make up this new character for Bray Wyatt, to completely re-Christian his character and get people talking about him for the first time in God knows when, only to have him go back to being a loser would be such a wasted opportunity. Now, I don't really... It doesn't really matter what your thoughts on this new character are. It doesn't really matter what you think of the new character. At this point, there's no debating that more people are talking about Bray Wyatt at this point in his career than at any other point in at least five years since his feud with John Cena. So to not take advantage of that would be stupid. So I really hope he doesn't go back to being just another fucking guy in the roster losing to Rey Mysterio and Seth Rollins and AJ Styles in a month or two. Because I think he's better than that. He never should have been that guy to begin with. He should have always deserved to be a top-level guy, um, winning more often than he loses, but that was never really quite the case with Bray Wyatt for whatever reason. But this is his big opportunity to repackage himself and become the main event star that he should have been consistently a long time ago. And uh, if they can't follow up on that properly, that is entirely the company's fault. Nor would it really surprise me, given their track record. Um, his second question, based on the current Raw ratings, is Baron Corbin's a rating killer slash channel changer? Honestly, I think so. But the Raw ratings being in the toilet... Obviously, it's not all Baron Corbin's fault. The show itself is not great. Uh, Baron Corbin being in the main event, though, doesn't help. I don't think he's the sole reason for the ratings being as low as they have been, but he's not helping the he's not helping that either. Baron Corbin being in the main event is not going to make people want to tune into Raw every single week. Oh, Baron Corbin's in the main event. I can't wait to watch Raw. Like that's never been the case. I like Baron Corbin, but they have to slot him wisely. You know, a, a bit better on the card. He was in the main event of Raw last week. He was in the main event of Raw this week. Hopefully that's it for Baron Corbin as the main event heel on that show for some time. I'd rather see Bobby Lashley in that spot. I'd rather see Drew McIntyre in that spot. Fuck, I'd rather see... Uh, what other heels do they have on that show? I don't even know. But th there are so many other people they could book in that position. Samoa Joe, for God's sakes. I'd rather see as the top... T <coughs> excuse me, as the top tier level heel um, compared to Baron Corbin who just does nothing for me in that role. As a solid mid-carder, he's good. But to be shoved down our throats constantly as the lead heel on Raw is a mistake, and it's absolutely not going to help the ratings. They're not. He's not the sole reason why they're in the toilet, like I said, but he's not helping the process either. At the average grunt from Twitter, his question was, do you have any match predictions for SummerSlam and TakeOver Toronto 2? I don't. I mean, TakeOver, maybe. But I think we have at least one other takeover before SummerSlam weekend. Reportedly, they're having a takeover in San Jose, California in June, which is cool. Um, I don't even know what they would do on that show, let alone let alone over SummerSlam weekend. For SummerSlam itself, I would have said Seth Rollins and AJ Styles, of course. Why wouldn't you do that at SummerSlam? But they're doing it fucking Money in the Bank in May, so... I think that match is off the table for SummerSlam. And unless they drag out the match until that show, which I don't think they will because it's currently April. I mean, we've seen some AJ feuds last a long time. The Shinsuke Nakamura feud lasted from like March through June until Money in the Bank. So it's possible that the AJ Rollins feud lasts that long. But sometimes by that point, it's like one match too many. So I hope not. But uh, for SummerSlam, I really do not know. Looking at the current landscape of the rosters... If Kofi's still champion by that point, which I doubt might be the case, Kofi and Randy Orton, I could see being a possibility. Maybe they put the belt on Lars Sullivan by that point. I mean, I hope not, but hey, you never know. They pushed Brock Lesnar within a matter of months. Brock Lesnar, a lot like Lars Sullivan, lest we forget, debuted the night after WrestleMania in 2002. By SummerSlam, he beat The Rock for the WWE title. Kofi Kingston is no Rock. So it would be a lot easier for Lars Sullivan to beat Kofi Kingston for that title compared to, you know, uh, Roman Reigns or something. So I could see, you know, Roman Reigns versus Kofi at SummerSlam would make sense. Roman and Roman and Randy Orton. Roman and Lars Sullivan I could see happening. There's a couple different matches. Um, if not AJ and Rollins for the Raw brand, Rollins and... Uh, there's a couple different people. Rollins and Joe again would be fine. I've heard Rollins and Corbin for the summer, which would be fucking terrible, so I hope not. Uh, Rollins and McIntyre would make sense as a SummerSlam United or, uh, Universal Championship main event. 
They also have, I mean, I guess if Brock comes back, they could do Brock and Rollins part two, which God, I hope not. That'd be awful. I really hope that's not the case. Um, if AJ's champion by that point, they could do AJ. I don't know. AJ and McIntyre would be cool. That's a possibility. Um, AJ and Joe we've seen before. I don't know. They have options though. Raw is pretty stacked at the moment. So I really cannot pinpoint a single match. I could see them doing it either a SummerSlam or takeover, but the Raw SmackDown and NXT rosters could be very much different by that point. I mean, granted the fucking superstar shakeup is going on every single week at this point. Apparently it's no longer a one week event. It lasts more than a week. Uh, according to WWE, at least based off what we saw on Raw and SmackDown this week. But, uh, you know, AJ could be back on SmackDown by that point. Who knows? But yeah, I really don't have like a single match I could see happening in either show just because the Raw, SmackDown, and NXT rosters are ever-changing and people are being pushed on a whim. So you never really know what might happen within the next four months, but I'm excited to find out. Um, at I don't know how to pronounce your Twitter handle here, but it's UIWUAGWU91 from Twitter. Their question was, following TakeOver New York, should it be considered that Johnny Gargano is perhaps the best NXT superstar ever? I think that was already well apparent even before TakeOver, to be honest with you. No one has had the amount of amazing matches in NXT that Gargano has had. Gargano could be regarded, not only could be, should be regarded as one of the best wrestlers, not only in NXT, not even in WWE, but like the entire fucking wrestling world today. I put him top five or top 10 easily, maybe top five, but you cannot deny the amount of amazing matches this guy has had in his time in NXT. The matches with Tommaso Ciampa, the matches with Andrade Sin Alamos, Aleister Black, Ricochet, Adam Cole are off the fucking charts. So I think to not include him or to not, you know, have him be uh, remembered as the greatest NXT superstar ever would be a mistake. Who else comes close? Finn Balor? Like... I guess Sami Zayn comes close. He was always the heart and soul of NXT. He didn't have the amount of, of amazing matches in NXT that uh, that Gargano has. So I would, I mean, Zayn's up there, but he's not number one. Joe had a great run in NXT. Nakamura was only there for about a year. Um, maybe Neville, he's up there too, but I really do think Gargano is far and away the greatest NXT superstar they've ever had. Far and away, it's not even close. At Jeremy8911 from Twitter, who are your picks to be in the Money in the Bank ladder matches? That's a good question. Um, I was thinking about that a few days ago, but I really like sat down to think about it when you asked me this question, and I wrote down two different uh, lineups for the men's and women's ladder matches at Money in the Bank. So again, this is all kind of drafted on like in a matter of minutes. I didn't really do too much analysis in regards to who should end up in what match and who should be wrestling in the, you know, in another match on the show. Like, I did not include Samoa Joe in the ladder match because I figure he might be defending his championship. But I did include Balor, though, because I could see him winning Money in the Bank and getting back to WWE Championship contention, assuming he's still, you know, he's not Intercontinental Champion by that point. I could see him dropping the belt between now and SummerSlam, now and Money in the Bank, whatever. But for the men's Money in the Bank ladder match, I think more, some of these are more so, like, dream picks than anything, but here are my picks nonetheless for the men's Money in the Bank ladder match. Rey Mysterio, who's not really doing too much right now, so I don't see why not. Ricochet in the men's Money in the Bank ladder match would be fucking cool, so that's why I include him. I feel like he kind of has to be in there. Either Ricochet or Cedric Alexander. Drew McIntyre, because he's got future world champion written all over him. Baron Corbin, people are not going to like, but what else do you do with him? He's not going for the title. There's really not much else for him to do. So I'd put Baron Corbin in that match. And then from SmackDown, Finn Balor, even though he's the current IC champion, I mean, unless he faces Andrade at that show, but I have Balor and Andrade in this match. Uh, I think Andrade and Money in the Bank would be cool. Mr. De Niro Del El Banco would be fucking sick uh, to steal from Alberto Del Rio a few years ago. But Balor, Andrade, Buddy Murphy, a lot like Ricochet being in this match would be fucking cool. And Cedric Alexander or Cedric Alexander. Uh, I feel like he could really shine in this match. And Aleister Black, Aleister Black would be really cool to see in a Money in the Bank ladder match. So, uh, yeah, Black, Murphy, Andrade, Balor, McIntyre, Corbin, Ricochet, and Rey Mysterio for the men's. For the women's from Raw, I have, and Raw doesn't have many, like, top-tier women here. With, like, Ronda Rousey being out, uh, Nia Jax is out currently, so 
The Raw Women's Division needs some help, but Naomi, I could put in there. I could Nikki Cross maybe too, but I don't see Nikki Cross being in the match. Naomi definitely. Alexa Bliss, assuming she's still active. I mean, she wrestled two weeks ago. She has not wrestled since, so I don't know what's going on with her. But Alexa Bliss is a former Miss Money in the Bank. Naomi, Natalia uh, would make sense, and Ruby Riot from SmackDown. Bailey, Ember Moon, Carmella, the first ever Women's Money, the Miss Money in the Bank. Um, and then I'm not sure. You have Paige, you are not Paige. You have Oscar and Kyrie Sane, but I assume they're going to be going for the women's tag team titles on that show. So I don't put them in the ladder match here. If they're not going to be in the ladder match, I could see it being a few different people. Mickey James, I have no really no real interest in seeing in the women's Money in the Bank ladder match. Uh, it could be Mandy Rose or Sonya, but I find it hard to believe that one of them would be in the match and not the other. So I, that's why I they, that that women's tag team title match could end up being a triple threat with Rose and Deville, and then Cena and Asuka, and then the Iconics. So that being said, um, what was I going to say? I don't even know what I was going to say. Oh, with those six women doing their own thing, they're not going to be in the ladder match. Lana, no thanks. Um, I put Liv Morgan in there. I think Liv Morgan can be in Dark Horse. I'm not a big Liv Morgan fan, but. Why the fuck not? Uh, why not put her in the uh, ladder match? She just arrived on SmackDown. She'd be a better choice than Mickey, who you know is not going to win. So Liv Morgan, Carmella, Ember Moon, Bailey, Naomi, Alexa Bliss, and Natalia, and Ruby Riot. Jeremy's second question. If they're not going to give him a chance to shine as a single star on SmackDown, do you think they should move Chad Gable to 205 Live? Yeah, I talked about this ad nauseum before, but yeah, Gable should be on 205 Live. I know he's only been back on SmackDown for a week, in his first night back on the show, he got attacked by Lars Sullivan. So maybe it'll be a different story next week, but it may not be. He may lose to fucking Jinder Mahal, so who knows. Um, but I do think at this point, if they're not going to do anything with the guy, and he's just going to lose to people like Jinder and Kevin Owens and whoever else on SmackDown, they might as well put him on 205 Live. So yeah, Chad Gable on 205 Live, I don't see why not at this point. He's better than 205 Live, but... Again, if he's just going to be toiling away in the undercard on SmackDown, I don't see why not. Jeremy's third question. Thoughts on Cesaro being moved to Raw, and could you see him going for the United States or Universal title sometime this year? Definitely not the Universal title. Raw has a lot of stars on their show. Uh, I do not see him jumping over the likes of AJ, Rollins, Joe, Braun, who I completely forgot was even on the show, McIntyre, Corbin, Miz, Mysterio, they have a pretty loaded roster. So that being the case, Chad Gable, or not Chad Gable, I'm, sorry, I'm looking at the other question, Cesaro being in the universal title picture is almost like not even remotely a possibility. So uh, yeah, I, I just don't see that happening. For the United States Championship, I could see that. Cesaro could be a very solid mid-card player, which is what he was. This is why I would have kept Cesaro on SmackDown, because Sheamus is hurt. You could have pushed him as a single seal on SmackDown, but... Whatever. Um, Cesaro being in the U.S. title picture, I like a lot. I don't know if he would be the one to beat Joe. He'd have to turn face in order to do that. But, uh, yeah. No, I like Cesaro being a solid mid-card player on Raw. I would love him to be more, but on Raw, I just do not see that happening, considering the amount of star power they have on that show. And the final few questions for today come from at Scarlet1. First one comes from, or first one is, Do you think Bobby slash Robert Roode's new look makes him seem like a stepdad? Yeah, someone tweeted about this. It was a pretty funny tweet from Monday's Raw, or during Monday's Raw. Um, yeah, he definitely looks like a stepdad. He looks like Rick Rude incarnated, uh, back to life. Uh, Rick Rude resurrected, I guess I should say. Uh, I guess that might be what they're going for here. I'm sure Vince McMahon took one look at him and is like, holy shit, like, he sees the second coming of Rick Rude and Bobby Rude, which is scary because Bobby Rude is better than that. But hey, he won on Monday's Raw, so who knows? It's... I'm not a big fan of the new look, but if it means they might be pushing him finally, then I'm all for it. But, uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes, and I'm, again, cautiously cautiously optimistic just because he won on Monday's Raw. They're finally doing something with him. He's not a tag team guy anymore. He's not a baby face. At least he's a heel. That's all I could say about that. Their second question, do you think Becky Lynch will remain a double champion past Money in the Bank? It's tough to say. I could see them dragging this out for a while. I, I kind of want to see this last for at least another month or two. Maybe not past SummerSlam, but Becky Lynch being a dual champion, like, a, you know, a la Jay Lethal from 2015, 2016, I could see that being the case. I would love to see that. So I don't see that happening. Uh, they didn't really last too long on Seth Rollins being a double champion. He lost one of his titles the very next month. 
So Becky Lynch very well uh, suffer that might very well might suffer a similar fate, considering she's in two matches on the same show at Money in the Bank facing La Lacey Evans for the Raw Women's Title, and then Charlotte Flair for the SmackDown Women's Title, and then. Lest we forget, we have the women's Money in the Bank ladder match that same night. So whoever wins the ladder match, depending on when it happens, could cash in on Becky that very same night. And quite honestly, I kind of see that happening. We saw that exact same la that that exact same thing last year with Alexa Bliss uh, winning the belt from I think it was Nia Jax after Nia Jax or during Nia Jax's match with Ronda Rousey. Uh, I see the same thing happening this year. I think Becky Lynch beats Lacey and Charlotte, but gets cashed, in, gets cashed in on that same night. She can beat one person, maybe two, but not three. So that's my prediction for the show. I just don't know who that would be. Based off my rosters for the women's match, or based off my roster for the women's match, Bailey would be interesting, turning heel in the process. That would be pretty cool. I guess it would kind of have to be a heel. So Bailey would be my pick, actually, the more I think about it. Ruby Riot, eh, I just, I've kind of given up on her. Alexa Bliss, been there, done that. Uh, and that's about it. Moon's a face, Carmella's a face, and Morgan could be a heel, but I don't want to see her be that person. So, yeah, Bailey. I would love to see Bailey win Money in the Bank and then cash in on Becky that very same night to win the uh, Smack the Women's title, of course. Uh, their third question, are you ready for Ant-Man to get his quote-unquote moment in Avengers Endgame? Yeah, I am ready. I'm looking forward to seeing what the movie has in store. I don't know if they're going to do what people are theorizing with Ant-Man entering the uh, butthole of Thanos and uh, growing back into normal size and blowing up Thanos from the inside out. That'd be fucking gross. Why the butthole, though? Why not, like, you know, I heard Paul Rudd talk about this on some talk show. Why the butthole and not, like, um, you know, his through the nose or through, like, his ear canal, whatever, whatever, through the ear, nose, why his butthole, I feel like that's a little too, it's a little too gross, I, I don't think that'll happen anyway, I think people are just having fun with it, there are people who think it actually will happen, and I fear for those people, and it might, who knows, I don't know, Avengers will be unpredictable to say the least, but um, <clears throat> I am looking forward to seeing Ant-Man get his moment, whatever that moment might be, maybe not necessarily that, I don't see him being the one to beat Thanos, I don't, I wrote a whole article about this for sports betting time a few weeks ago on the odds for Ant-Man being the one to ultimately defeat Thanos. I do not see that being the case. I feel like there are way better options than Ant-Man for that role. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he does regardless. Ant-Man with the rest of the Avengers, um, if Civil War was any indication, it's going to be a lot of fun. We didn't get to see him interact with the other Avengers in Infinity War because his movie was taking place at the same time in that universe as, uh, Ant-Man the Wasp movie was happening simultaneously with Infinity War. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what's in store for Ant-Man in Endgame. Final two questions first, also from Scarlet One. Thoughts on Enzo and Kaz XL apparently being done in Ring of Honor? Yeah, I, I saw that. Um, what a waste. I mean, it was a cool opportunity for Ring of Honor to get some buzz around them at G1 Supercard. Which is really all it was, was buzz. Because they didn't do anything with them after that. They weren't the tapings, they weren't brought up by Ring of Honor. It's kind of a wasted opportunity, to be honest with you. I'm not a big fan of Enzo and Cass being brought into Ring of Honor. I talked about that before, but I guess to do nothing with them is like, why even bother in the first place? To get, again, buzz for your pay-per-view, even though this has nothing to do with anything? I just, I don't know. I feel like it's stupid. I felt like it was dumb. I feel like they will be back at some point. That's my prediction. If they were brought in for this, they will be back eventually. Maybe Ring of Honor is waiting for them to waiting for it to die down a bit, so it feels more of a, like a surprise when it happens again down the road. That's my prediction, but if they are actually done with Ring of Honor and they don't come back, that was a stupid moment then. It was a complete wasted opportunity. And again, I don't want to see them in the company to begin with, but uh, why bother booking it if it's not going to lead anywhere? That seems short-sighted to me. Final question, do you think 205 Live will make any significant changes in 2019? I talked about this a while ago, but I don't think they will. I really don't. I think they might call up more people from NXT. People like Raul Mendoza or Shane Thorne and people like that. Maybe, hopefully, ACH and Trevor Lee. But aside from call like, calling up new people, what other changes do you think they would make? Yeah, like, obviously, moving it to full sale would be great. Having it air on tape delay on Wednesdays or whatever would be cool. I, I just don't see that being the case because if it's been live for almost three years now, why now? Why not a year ago when they first, you know, had Triple H take over? 
if Triple H couldn't get that done then, I don't see them changing that now. And I think the only reason they don't do that is because uh, they had the cruiserweights on some of these pay-per-views. I would keep them to just to just the big four pay-per-views. Have it be like NXT where they tape all the TV within a few weeks and have a build to a match at a live pay-per-view over a big four weekend like a takeover and have that happen at, you know, SummerSlam, Survivor Series, maybe Money in the Bank, WrestleMania, Royal Rumble. Because having them go after SmackDown on, on Tuesday nights is a total waste. The crowd does not care. They totally sit on their hands for the entire show. Having them before SmackDown was nice, and that was a, they were a bit better off at that point. But just full sale would just be a way better idea. That's the only major change I could see them making with 205 Live. Because other than getting rid of it all together, which I don't think they'll do, because they have like international deals they have to adhere to and stuff like that. They just may not care about it like they do with main event and superstars, or did with superstars before they did away with it in 20. 20- 16 to make way for 205 Live, actually. Um, unless that's the case, I don't see any major changes with 205 Live, which is a shame because the, the the show could use a bit of a tweaking. It's a way better show than, again, it was about a year and a half ago when Enzo was champion, when, when Enzo is in possession of the title and stuff like that. But it's not great. Like, Ari Daivari, Tony Nese, I don't care. Who gives a shit? If people weren't watching when Buddy Murphy and Cedric were on the show and Ali, why would they watch now? Unless significant changes are made, which they should be made, but I don't see that happening. Because again, if they were going to be made, they would have been made a long time ago. There was a glimmer of hope when they started taping it before SmackDown in the fall and moved it to Wednesdays for a brief period. That I thought was pretty cool, but that was only for the Mixed Match Challenge. And then after that was over, they moved it back to Tuesdays. So, whatever. But, uh... Yeah, hopefully 205 Live can improve in the coming months. I don't see that happening unless they get like a significant overhaul. But again, if nothing pushed them to kind of repackage the show a few months ago uh, with Triple H in charge, if he even still is in charge, I'm not sure, then why now is my question. I I just don't see that happening. And that does it, guys, for today's super stacked edition of Hashtag Ask You Sam episode 282. Thank you guys for sending in your questions as always. We went almost an hour and a half, I think. Yeah, just about an hour and 20 minutes, which is fucking crazy. Uh, Easily the longest show in a while. So thank you guys for sending your questions. As always, you send them in. I'll answer them. Tweet me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. You can find me on Facebook as well at Facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. Leave your question on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section of this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. So with all that being said, guys, have a great rest of your week. Enjoy Endgame tomorrow if you're going to watch it on Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. If you watch it any later than Thursday or Friday, stay off of social media. That's all I'm going to say right now. Do yourself a favor and get the fuck off of Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and everything else you own. Just stay in your house, electricity off, and just wait until you go see Endgame. Anyway, guys, have a great one. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.